Yay, we have music. Look at this. We're both here at the same time. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Hacking Gourmet. You know what? So I actually read the meeting notes. I'm going to make you read this. So did you actually, you, did you, you read your own notes? You want to, you want to introduce this way? I will, uh, I, I think so. Let's you're, see. You're putting Let's... down the gauntlet right out of the gate. So by the way, if you're just joining us, thank you for joining <laughs> us on uh, Hacking Gourmet. I am Drewy. I'm the meterator, which basically means I just sit down and rope everybody all together try to control some of these live discussions. I really don't do much of anything, um, and, and I'm okay with that. Uh, anyway, so we're here to actually have a guest. It's an unusual circumstance, a whole lot of reasons. Number one, Brian, unfortunately, has been detained and he will not be tonight. So uh, we lost both viewers that wanted to watch Brian right now at that moment. And Carney is also not cooking, so uh, basically his mom just logged off the ship as well. So, uh, but I'm here. And we do have a guest, and you probably know him from the um, the chat room. He's probably been from watching the show from the very beginning. Uh, Chris Rosenthal is going to join us here in a little bit. But uh, so, Jonathan, what, what's up? You're not you're not you're not cooking. You're sick. You 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 party too hard at the Super Bowl. It was no no. I you know I uh, it was a very busy last week. Um, the Super Bowl was out of control. We had a bunch of events. We were down in Tampa. And then I uh, had a little Super Bowl party last night. And uh, no, I'm just uh, I'm just not feeling it today. I know we got Chris lined up. He's got a great uh, menu set up. And uh, I just really was backed up for the last few days. So uh, the train's going by behind me. Sorry. Uh, so no, I decided we'd sit back and relax. And then also at the same time, I, I was planning on doing a dry age beef piccata, which was going to be kind of cool. I was going to flatten a piece of dry aged beef. However, I'm going to read the entrance that was supposed to be read. <laughs> okay. Welcome. And by the way, I don't blame you. Welcome to Hacking Gourmet. Thank you for joining us for the Rose with our special guest, Chris, the troll Rosenthal of Tobacco Rolls in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We ask you at this time to support and share this live feed, but we do have the troll on us. So I figured, honestly, if it could be any day for us to go after Chris, the way he goes after us, I wasn't going to cook and I was going to sit back and critique everything that he was doing. Not only have I done that, but we've given him the grill cam today, Fred. He's going to have the full access to the grill cam. We even included him on the top five list. Uh, so he's oh, going to wow. get the full experience um, from me. Um, so we're going to give it to him. I know we've got some special things planned for him today. So we want this to be about Chris. Um, you know, we, we're here to stroke this for him. And uh, here he goes. So, but yeah. Is is. Is is he do an order of cigars? Why do, why are we being this nice? Oh, he certainly does <laughs> order cigars for me. The uh, so no, it'll be interesting. Wrap. But we'll bring him on in just a minute. But no, no, Fred, it was a really unique uh, week. The Super Bowl was awesome. Um, we did do some some food stuff there, so the Hacking Gourmet was advertised, which was nice. And we did um, we had some food one evening from. Uh, it was all for meat and bone, but uh, I, I prepared it. We did one evening a barbecue uh, barbecue filet mignon dish. It was great. It had uh, fried onions on top. Um, we did barbecue sauce, homemade barbecue sauce on top of that. And uh, the fun thing is I did actually sous vide. People are like, oh, are you cooking? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, when are you going to cook? I mean, I was cooking for two, 300, 400 people. Um, it's really hard to do that. So the, the program we had set up, our sauces pre that we already have pre-mixed, pre-made we sous vide the, uh, the beef mm -hmm. items are already chopped up and then we did cheese plates and stuff so it was really exciting and then uh the highlight of it was with uh, davidoff in tampa right down the street uh from the stadium um we did a uh, chimichurri filet mignon it was fantastic uh we, uh, man there was there was over six <coughs> six hundred people um at the oh, wow. establishment that night and it was so busy there were people out in the parking lot smoking cigars in front of their cars I mean, I'd never seen anything like it um, at all at any Super Bowl, let alone one that was uh, scaled back. I mean, it was quite a, quite a crazy week. But, uh, but, yeah, it was fun. And yesterday we prepared some uh, dry-aged beef. I did tomahawk ribeyes and some lamb. I did it right on the fire. I posted some pictures up of that. And I made some mac and cheese, which I just finished up. Not much. Yeah, I was surprised. That, so Tampa was pretty loaded. Like, there was more people in, um, in the stadium than I thought were going to be. Like I know they were doing the scaled back, but then when I saw the stadium shots, I'm like, wow, they're really uh, they've got got that much going. Yeah, I think there was like twenty five thousand, and then the seats that were empty, you could buy a seat 
for like a hundred bucks and I think they entered you into a contest so they printed out your silhouette so the stadium looked pretty full but I mean 25,000 is a quarter of that stadium so that's the fullest we've seen any sports stadium in over a year. oh right yeah 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 so the uh, trolling's already starting on uh in the in the the chat box here we do have Cole Averlon Cole says uh, uh is Chris cooking 80s hotel food uh so possibly we'll find out uh, so we've already got we've already got the uh, chat box going, but uh, we might as well bring him on, Fred. Yeah, I don't even I don't even understand the reference of the '80s thing, but uh, maybe it's because he wears his hair ha, has hat backwards. I don't know. I don't know what the '80s thing is. I don't know. Well, beef Wellington, all sorts of classic side dishes, things like that. Hey, okay, Wellington is '80s, like 1800 something. So let's get this right. But Eris, come on, come to the show. Just for yourself, 80s cooking, even know what even means. Um, I welcome. Yeah, classics are called classics for a reason. Uh, but welcome to, I like to call treachery a troll. Um, <laughs> might as well own it if I'm going to get hammered all night. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad to be here. So those of you that have been following, Chris is, is always in the chat room um, helping people find the error of their ways and educate them on some better techniques. Was that a pretty good way to put it? Was that, was that a, was that about as politically correct as I could get? That's pretty, that's pretty close. I mean, I do it out of love. I mean, I don't want to, you know, oh, of course people go on, going, going through, going through life, you know, with the wrong information. So, so give us background. Um, well, well, twofold. One, obviously, the cigar shop, which which I think some people don't know. But let's start with the cooking background. So, what Drew? And the, I know you've been around cook food for a while, like like everybody else on the show. Give us your background because you have a different different environment, I guess. I'll, I'll wait about five seconds for the train. To yeah, pass. let's wait for the train. Oh. Let's wait for the. Uh, you know, he learned to find the mute no, button I mean, once in a while, so that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's really a background. I can tell you, uh, my mother can cook about chicken noodle soup, and if she's watching, it's delicious. Um, and my, my grandmother is an excellent cook, uh, but I don't recall, and she lived close by growing up, but I don't recall a whole lot of cooking sessions other than, you know, baby, you want me to make you some, some pork tenderloin at four in the morning when we came home. Uh, <laughs> It, it might have just stemmed from a lot of food network in college in between studying for, you know, med school type classes. And uh, it kind of grew from there. And I kind of found out I was not so bad at it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Are you uh, are you more of the science of cooking or the art of cooking? A little bit of both. I don't tend to use a recipe very often. I tend to use recipes only for guidelines for proportions. Um, mm -hmm. I like a little bit of the science stuff. I like the gadgets and the tools. I understand some of the science of how the food breaks down or how, you know, certain things go together. But other than that, you know, just kind of wing it. Uh, so somewhere in between, I would say art and art and science. What yeah. would you, um, so what about, so what, what, so what's your, what's your go-to category? Like yeah, everybody has a go-to category. For me, it's 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 predominantly meat. You know, individual beef Wellingtons, steak, prime ribs, definitely a go-to category for me. Bacon, burnt ends, popovers. So, what what are some of the things in your wheelhouse? You just like you know, this is what you're gonna make for somebody. You know, the meat. I mean, you know, not to be all oh, we're on a meat show, but uh, you know, no, it's not meat just for meat. Italian. Um, Meat, meat, meats are Italian. I can, I can handle just about any cut of meat. Uh, Italian, you know, it's, some of it's so easy. I feel, you know, embarrassing. That's my go-to because uh, it's, it's pasta, it's sauce. It's, I mean, at least you know, American Italian. Guys, um, but yeah, guys, I need to ask Italian, you a question real say. quick. I need to ask you a question real quick for about six seconds. I need everybody not to say anything. Um, if you're watching the show, you're not going to really miss anything. You might see a little, a little, uh, uh, th a little time thing here. Uh, there's a Wi-Fi disruption about to hit, and it's going to fix itself. So just stay by, stay, stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. I'll let you know when it's back.
guys there? Because I've doubled the amount of viewers you've had on previous shows? Nah, we had an issue where uh, there's a couple different Wi Fi networks here, so there was an issue with the sound quality. It was really lagging. Um, so I, I switched over the Wi Fi network, and the show's still going live. We put it on a little hold screen there. Uh, but we're back. I, I like. I like how you made it sound like you were like Billy Bob Thornton in Armageddon going, we're about to have a Wi-Fi incident here. Like like you've been tracking the Wi-Fi and there's this something coming over to cut it off. And you were cutting off Chris when he was talking about Italian food, which by the way, Italian food is my favorite food. Trace and I live in Italy. Um, Chris, I'm gonna have one, I'm gonna add a qualifier to your, to your discounting the um, Italian food is like, look, anybody can do it. Anybody can make pretty much decent Italian food. Like it, it's hard to screw, I mean, it, it, but but if you're talking about good Italian food and if you've had that, it is different. I mean, it is very different, but yeah, can someone, you know, look, I always end up making pasta for 700 and sauce for like five. So I, I never have those ratios, right? But I mean, you know, anybody can slap together, but when you're talking about good Italian food, like if you've been to Italy or you have the ability or you've tried it, it, it nothing compares. Like you're not happy with just mainstream Olive Garden pasta anymore, I'm sorry. No, you're, you're no. right. You're, you're right. Um, there, there, are, there are tricks in the trade, though. Um, I mean, seasoning, tasting, and always make more sauce than you need. Oh, yeah. All right. So, um, Jonathan, what do, you, what do you got? Wait, let's see. What time is it? Do we have uh, – I should look at the notes. Do we have uh, – we're in the no, middle so, of team banter. Yeah, so we're in the middle of team banter. So what we got going on right now is I was going to cook today. I said I was going to do a piccata dish, and um, – I really thought that, you know, we talked about some things here, and we'll bring this up when we have some gourmet facts, but Italian is, this is essentially our Valentine's Day episode, Italian is really uh, the largest cuisine consumed over Valentine's Day. Um, so I was going to do an Italian dish there, um, but uh, but Chris, tell us a little bit of what you got going on and what you're preparing today for us. Oh, I got a lot of stuff going on since I found out five minutes ago I'm the only one cooking today. Um, we could probably start with the cocktail. I mean, we got to stretch some time here. I uh, pre-prepared a classic rum cocktail. If you don't know me yet, I'm a rum guy. Uh, it's called the Jungle Bird. It's got, you know, a few ingredients in it. Pineapple juice, rum, obviously, simple syrup. Um, what One main ingredient that's in it is Campari. Uh, great cocktail for using that bottle of Campari that you bought a decade ago for a Sopranos watch party um, to, to make Negronis. So what I'm going to do, though, to make a little twist on it, I'm going to take a classic Jungle Bird cocktail, and I'm going to turn it into a sour. There are competing, or at least arguments, on the difference between a sour and a flip. A sour actually means you just added an egg white. A flip means you added a whole egg. Um, a lot of people will call anything with an egg white a flip. They're wrong. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm dry shaking it first because aerating or putting air into the egg sometimes makes my shaker explode. Um, so I'm going to dry shake it first to to kind of try to avoid that on camera and then I'm going to add ice and then I'm going to strain it back into the coop um, and we almost had an explosion so one thing I will say but, our ingredients are brought to you today by our friends at Uncle Steve Shakes UncleSteveShake.com Uncle Steve, thank you, enjoy it I'm headed back to Miami tonight and I'll be using some Uncle Steve Shakes this evening but uh, back to Chris here as he serves up his drink 
So I added ice. Um, I'm going to shake it kind of slowly. I really need a better shaker. Um, I was going to comment on that. I, that's at least, I have four to five shakers uh, that I use on a regular basis that are all better than the one that you have right there. I don't know. It looks cool. That's all that matters. <laughs> shameless plug Shameless plug from a real cigar company. Davidoff of Geneva gave me this at the New Orleans trade show many, many years ago. Uh, and we and we all and we all know how Davidoff chooses lesser grade products for their swag items. Oh no wait, they don't. <laughs> well, you did start that by saying it was trash. No, he said he should yes, get a better one. He didn't say that was trash. <laughs> I feel like Either I'm. Way, I feel like, I'm, uh, I, I feel like it, I'm on the keeping him honest portion of the show right now. Like you know, I like how Jonathan rolls in here with stuff that he was gonna make, because that's really. What, so I was actually gonna make a duck pate croute and a huntsman pies and also some Thai steamed coconut pandan cake, um, but I'm not cooking today. So um, you know, <laughs> that, that, I mean, it's just come on. That is a good looking. Take it away, Chris. <clears throat> it is good looking. So, so you, you did a flip, right? All, you didn't do a sour. No, I did a sour. Sour just as you did a sour. I can't think of, yeah, I can't think of anything that I, you know, other than like an egg cream or something that would use a whole egg. Um, but all of all, all turning into a sour really does is give you a frothy, kind of you know thicker texture. I had these made at the beginning of the pandemic because you know it didn't have a bartender to make me cocktails anymore. So now I have. I don't know if you can see it. I have fancy. Uh, Rose. Take it to the other side of the, take it to the other side of the camera, Chris. Yeah, yeah that's fancy, beautiful right there. Fancy rose. It's got a rose sugar edible garnish oh, nice. on it. Ooh, um, look at that! Bonus points for garnish there. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna beautiful. hand it off to my wife because I'm already Smart drinking wolf. straight rum. Hey, dude, do you do you know what I do with do you know what I do with egg white? I I uh I use egg white in almost all my margaritas now, just because I like that foam and that froth. Um, yeah, it's amazing it texture wise. Man. Oh, it's awesome, man! It's just I, I started doing that probably like four or five months ago. You said, as you started experimenting with different things or things you like, and, and yeah, egg white goes in all my margaritas now. I mean, the only thing yeah, I could think absolutely. of with it, it would be a whole egg for me would be like an eggnog or you know like a Tom and Jerry type thing or something like that. But I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I other than that, no. Yeah, I can't think of an actual cocktail. I'm sure there are hundreds out there, but you know, as Cole said, those are probably 1980s recipes. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the sours. Uh, I don't know if we want to move on to the next course. I made an actual tartare. There will be no roast beets or tofu around. Oh, um, the last see, show. Somebody... That, you know what? I'm a, I'm all down for that. Cause I was, I had, I almost, I wanted to call you out on the beet tartare. Cause I'm like, I, I actually looked up the definition of dark tartare to see if you could even get away remotely with that description of it, which you could, but it was just unfair and wrong. I mean, you guys are aware my girlfriend is a vegetarian, so when I cook it on these doesn't shows, make it right. I have to make her something. She has it's to. Not eat. on the show, you don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good one. The, the reason I, uh, the reason some of those dishes, you know what I've been doing with some of those uh vegetarian and vegan dishes i've been making the last few weeks uh there's a restaurant in miami with chris you're probably familiar with. it's called planta um it's one of the top rated restaurants in the city in terms of recognition i um, mean it's entirely vegan they make some incredible stuff like they do vegan sushi with uh with fish that they made uh, tuna that they make out of watermelons i um, mean it's quite fascinating so i've been there a few times and they do some great sours there too they have a activated charcoal drink that's very similar to what you just made um, that's fascinating there too, and again, the texture on it's incredible. I'm sorry, and and I want I want to go on Chris on this tartar, but I do want to ask one question here. Did you say veg, vegan sushi was not fish? That it was watermelon? They 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 take watermelon and they brine it in this way that changes the texture of it, and I'll tell you, it it, it almost tastes like tuna. Yeah, okay, fascinating. Well, all right. You know, I, I've really had enough of these conspiracy theories, that being the trend lately. So, uh, all right, let's go back to Tartar. So they made they made sushi even worse than it already was. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, all right, so Tartar, standard, classic, 1980s, Cole Admiral Tartar. Um, instead of using a 
uh, a sirloin or a top round, like most recipes call for. I like to have a little bit of fat in my tartare. So uh, either use a ribeye or a strip. If you use a strip, you take off that full fat cap, waste it, throw it out. You don't need it. Um, that's what I use today. I used a just a prime, not a Wagyu tar, uh, strip. Um, pretty standard uh, ingredients for the dressing, uh, mustard, Worcestershire and balsamic for that umami. Um, I used a, instead of a, a white wine vinegar, I used a champagne vinegar from Reims. Um, that's the champagne region of France. Um, shallot, parsley, salt, pepper, and I'm gonna finish it with an egg yolk. I really wanted to do a um, salt cured egg yolk and shave it over the top, but I ran out of time. And surprisingly, nobody on the internet sells it. So business idea. Hmm. It's funny, Cole and I, Cole was doing a lot of um, salt cured egg yolks over over last year during uh, March and went on. And um, he brought a couple down to me and he was talking the same thing because he was like, you just can't get them anywhere, blah, blah, blah. So he's doing them on his own. But uh, it was really unique. It was a really unique item. If you've never had that, um, salt cured egg yolks are really unique. Super unique. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge, go ahead. No, I was just going to say tartare is a great thing. Uh, people can stomach the, the raw beef. There's a little citrus in there, so it'll kind of cook. Um, but you can chop it ahead of time. I chopped it last night to save time. Uh, you can even make the dressing ahead of time. Just don't mix it until you're ready to serve it. Um, most recipes I've found, at least proportion-wise, since I don't really use a recipe, um, I end up using about half what the dressing proportion actually was and then we just save it and use it you know the next day on noodles or something else otherwise it just gets too runny yeah i'm a big uh big fan of tartare my my disappointment over the over my lifetime is that how more and more steakhouses uh started taking it out from one a very small liability standpoint in the scheme of the world and then also just you know wasn't ordering but if you're in tampa uh, one of my favorite ones for getting um, tartare is uh, Burn Steakhouse, which is a very classic steakhouse in Tampa. It lo literally looks like a brothel. It's just wood and red velvet curtains. Uh, but they actually have some excellent tartars on there. And they have a black truffle tartare, uh, black truffle tenderloin tartare, and they do it with quail eggs. Um, outstanding. They also have a regular tartare, and they have a foie gras and stuff like that. But they have a black truffle tartare that is well worth it if you're at Burns in Tampa. Um, Chris, what do you got on the side for crackers there? And is, do you have a little, what, what's the, what's in between the crackers or the bread and the tartare you're putting together? All right. Yeah. yeah. So the crackers, I found these and, you know, shameless plug. Hopefully they want to pay me for a sponsorship down the road. Whole Foods brand sells these little mini toasts. They're absolutely perfect. Oh, so awesome. They look like little toasts. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, great. They're, they're, and they look like little They're the coolest thing. They're the coolest thing ever. Yes. Big, big fan. Uh, in between the toast and, and where I'm going to eventually plate the tartare, there is chopped egg yolk. Uh, I'm sorry, full chopped uh, uh, hard-boiled egg. Um, texturally, it's good. It adds a little bit of flavor, but not much. I'm a big fan of it. Um, I've seen it in just about every presentation in fancy restaurants I've been to, so I adapted it. I don't boil my own eggs. You can buy them at Whole Foods. Um, so yeah, I've, I've mixed the uh, I've mixed the tartare. I got my fancy little ring mold that I probably overused, but whatever. Um, usually, I would plate this with my favorite black uh, salt, black lava salt, but I am out and I can't find it. So I'll just plate a regular kosher salt. That's fine. There was this one article I was reading. You might have seen it, Chris. I think you and I might have shared it too. Um, but there was this one article I was reading about things that chefs don't um, pre-make on their own or they just buy already done for them. And it was like, if they're unless they're going to hard boil an egg where it's still runny in the center, uh, you know, where they're really controlling the temperature, uh, eggs was one of the ones on the list where they like, they buy hard boiled eggs because why waste your time that the result's going to be the same uh, no matter what. Uh, exactly. So I thought that was an interesting one. And I do the same thing. Who wants, who wants to peel eggs? Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. By the way, Cole, Chris uh, has uh, cured has salt cured egg yolks that he could have sent you, and he also has uh, black lava salt that he could have sent. Yeah, but Cole, the black lava 
the black lava salt has to be flaky. I don't want the 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 soft pretzel salt. I need the flaky stuff. Yep. So I just broke my egg yolk uh, because I tried to mise en place and prep it. Um, so I'm going to be off camera for about 17 seconds while I get another egg yolk. Well, that's a good time for us to jump over to one of our uh, one of our things here. We can uh, bring up our gourmet smoke session, which we have coming up. Um, we do have a gourmet Absolutely. smoke session coming up. Oh, that's Brian McGee here. <clears throat> Fred, you're everybody today. Um, but yeah, gourmet smoke session. We've got uh, on February 18th. I gotta pull this up. February, sorry, February 19th, Friday. February 19th, we're going to be in Hartford, Connecticut. We're very close to sold out. We're going to have about 100 guests there. Uh, our meat and, bones gonna, meat and Bones is going to be providing us a great menu for that evening. We're doing a really classic Valentine's Day meal. Um, it's going to be twin filet mignons. These are going to be Wagyu Angus Cross. Um, we've got a Caribbean lobster tail. We also have a truffle cheese from Italy there. Uh, the salt and pepper finishing salt. And it uh, should be a really great meal. We're going to be cooking a filet mignon there in person. Uh, in person, there will be one substitute if you're going to be there view, uh, viewing with us. Uh, we will have uh, the Caribbean rock shrimp. It's just going to be easier for me to cook uh, rather than doing, you know, 40 or 50 lobster tails. Uh, so we'll be doing Caribbean, uh, Caribbean, uh, sorry, not Caribbean shrimp, the uh, red Argentinian shrimp, which I think are fantastic flavor on them. Uh, so we'll have those there, but that'll be February 19th live uh, right here on Hacking Gourmet on LFD Cigars Facebook page um, as well as YouTube. Uh, those have been growing each month. Um, and Fred, a really fun thing. Uh, this is the uh, this is going to be big because this is our first session live in person since Christmas. Um, so that'll be great. And this is starting from here on out. All of our sessions that we have planned uh, will be live and in person. And we've got something really exciting nice. planned uh, for March too. And um, we'll have that. We're going to have a special viewing session for that. So on our next episode of Hacking Gourmet on the 22nd of February, we'll be announcing our March session. But February 19th, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We'll see you there to celebrate Valentine's Day. You can go to meatandbone.com, search the word hacking, and all of our packages will pop up. Um, but, yeah, we're looking forward to be out in person and, uh, and start ex uh, expanding uh, expanding where we've been. And uh, the travel is going to start uh, start growing for us with this so uh that's the next show coming up february 19th i actually ordered the package uh last week matter of fact i have a message from meat and bone to call them back uh today but um i seriously doubt that i will have those items last that long in my house and not cook them uh to get them to the, I, I mean i just know me and they're gonna sit in there and i'm like i'm gonna be all over whenever they send it to me uh, plus, it's Valentine's Day, and I don't celebrate Valentine's Day, so I'll probably do it the day before or something. Yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm actually gonna be in Orlando um, for that weekend. I'll let you know if I'm up. Well, I do have Valentine's Day plans, but I'm gonna be up here for the next. Um, I'll be back in Miami this week, then I'll be in Orlando for about a week and a half for some vacation, and uh, so we'll connect up and, and have some steak. And yeah, some give me a shout. I'm still sit sitting on some uh, candy corn yes. for you from Thanksgiving, so uh, yeah, loyal. definitely. That's right. Let's go back to Chris and see what he's doing. Chris, I know, is finishing up plating on the tartare. Um, are there All right, so we're, we're done with the – got to find a Perfect. good, happy medium. There Perfect. you go, yeah. Um, there, there's your tartare. Pretty classic, nothing crazy. One pet peeve about uh, tartare before we move on to the next course is I absolutely hate the lazy hipsters these days that do a rough chop on the steak. Take the time, use a little muscle, and chop it just like you'd run it through a grinder, um, just slightly less than you would a grinder. Otherwise, I would have used a grinder. That's my big pet peeve on tartare, getting cube steak like it looks like tuna tartare. So let me ask you this. So I am a huge fan of capers with the tartare, and I noticed you just looked like you had the garnish on the caper but didn't really have like a side of extra capers on the plate. Not a not, not, a, not a caper guy. No, the wife the okay. wife loves the capers. I have a serious problem. If we if we had a two hour show, I'd tell you about all my pet peeves with brined uh, ingredients. Um, mm -hmm. Things things that you That's can't fair. eat without brine. Things that you can't eat without brining shouldn't be shouldn't be eaten. Uh, we'll leave That's it at fair. that. Pickles, <laughs> olives, capers. By the way, we did hear your wife's disagreement in the background. Um, she seems very adamant that she disagrees. Do you not brine turkey? 
No, I brine a turkey. So you don't when do I, any brine. Cook, How do you cook your turkey then? If you you don't brine it, uh, do you introduce any moisture into it? I I, I make a compound herb butter, uh, garlic herb butter. I stuff it under the skin. I use a one of the uh, oilless deep fryers, which is essentially like you know an outdoor convection propane type oven thing. Um, it cooks it in about an hour and a half to two hours instead of four. It's, you know, longer than a deep fryer, but shorter than an oven. Um, and then it cooks out, you know, base it over top a couple times. It's fine. Yeah, we don't we don't brine turkey at our house either. Um, so I thought it was interesting. But uh, you do got to introduce some sort of moisture or fat to it because it does just naturally dry out because there's not a lot of moisture there. Um, but uh, I, I don't do yeah. brine turkey. I do brine... I do brine chicken, and I when I brine chicken, I, I don't do it with a salt brine. I do it really just citrus, so I'm essentially just marinating it. Uh, I soak my chicken in orange juice. I'll take a whole gallon of orange juice and just soak it in it. I think it gives it a really good flavor to it. Um, so I do do introduce citrus, but I don't do a lot of brining myself either. Beauty. All right, what's, next on, on. what's next on the uh, menu? Uh, next on the menu, I'm going to do a... A scallop with a uh, a fontina risotto and a roasted red pepper sauce that I made ahead of time. A um, couple fun techniques in, in this recipe, so we'll go over those as we get to them. Uh, first thing is on the risotto, people super scared of making risotto, especially for a large group of people because it takes 30 to 40 minutes to cook. Um, but one of the tricks is, and this is why you don't wait 30 to 40 minutes for uh a restaurant risotto is there's about four or five additions to liquid in a risotto. Um, I think most restaurants will add about four additions of liquid and then hold it there. Um, and then when you order it, they will, you know, throw it back on the heat and add the fifth addition of liquid and then it's done. It takes probably five or six minutes at that point in time. And it makes the whole process way easier, especially if you're serving a risotto as a dish for a lot of people. Um, but I'm going to fire the scallops first. Um, these are U10 scallops. Um, extremely hard to find something like a U10 scallop in um, the middle of the Midwest in the middle of winter. Um, but I found them. That just means that they're under 10 count per pound, makes them a little bit bigger. Uh, key note when, when, when making your scallops, make sure you pat them dry first. They're going to go to the pan with oil. Um, so throw not, when you pat the scallops, scallops, when you pat the scallops dry, not only does that allow it to cook up a little better and take some of the moisture away, it also lets those scallops know that they're going to do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I always, I always leave them on a, a plate with a paper towel that just helps with the moisture. Um, and then I will have less of a mess to clean up uh, later. So I complimented Fred. I complimented um, Chris, and he spent a lot of time and effort on getting this set up. Obviously, there are angles here are fantastic. Um, you know, Brian's not on the show, but I think we could all take a little bit of advice on uh, on some of these camera angles here. And the lighting. Look at the lighting. It's not a dark kitchen with dogs roaming around. <laughs> all right what do you got in the other so, pan you got your risotto right on the on the far side oh yeah yeah good call good call uh the, the key to holding your risotto and the key to any risotto or it's a key in a risotto is when you add your stock you have to have it in a different pan you have to have it at temperature you don't want to be adding cold stock to a hot pan um so in my other in my other pot here i have my stock it's just below a simmer. Um, when I'm ready to, uh, to add the last uh, portion of liquid to it, when my scallops are done, then I will crank it back up and it'll be close to a simmer to, or a boil. Um, but yeah, having that hot stock ready to go is, is one of the big keys in just a regular risotto, whether you're holding it at or holding it between the fourth and fifth edition or just doing it straight through. So yeah, I'm a big scallops, risotto gonna, fan. Yeah, on the scallops, I'm gonna season with just a little salt because who likes unseasoned food? Um, 
And then we're going to go down in the clockwise. I stole this from Gordon Ramsay, but it seems to work. You go down in the clockwise. By the time you get back to the top, it's pretty much time to flip them. Um, I got about 10 here. We're going for about 90 seconds to, to two minutes per side. I don't know if I have this. I don't have the sound on this one, but the sizzle is amazing. Yeah, we can hear the sizzle. It's great. Yeah. It does sound better than a blender. <laughs> yeah. I um, apologize for the dog. He will stop barking as soon as my guests show up to eat the food that I won't eat. By the way, I don't eat seafood. Um, so I had to invite people over yeah. to eat it. The dog didn't start until after you made fun of uh, Brian's dogs. <laughs> True story. So, <clears throat> fun note, Rosie. I do I do have a culinary themed dog. I have a Legoto Romagnolo. It is a breed of dog they use in Italy to find the truffles because you don't have to feed them the truffles um, like you do the pigs for them to keep finding it. So, Rose, you're not. Oh, really? I don't, okay. I don't consider you a picky eater. Um. But you're not a seafood guy, huh? Are you allergic, or you just what's the deal? No, just not a fan. I've lived in, I've lived in Boston. I've been to all the places you should. Um, I eat seafood in all the places I should eat seafood. I just um, the the shellfish. I don't like the sweetness. I'll eat a scallop here and there. If I'm in the Keys, I'm gonna eat grouper. I'm gonna eat mahi. Um, but I just don't search it out. It's not my favorite texture. So while those scallops are waiting, Fred, why don't we jump to our top five list here? All right. So our top five today, we uh, sticking with the theme. Um, top five is brought to you by Wood Butcher, WoodButcherMain.com. Find all sorts of nice cutting boards. He's doing. Uh, he's actually doing some uh, ice fishing traps right now. So I just saw some of those posts up online. But we picked a top five flowers. So Fred, take it away. Top yeah, sorry. Flowers. Uh, top five flowers. Uh, one of these guys clearly did not understand the exercise of this, so but we'll let you decide. One of these things is not like the other. Uh, Chris chose roses, ornamental peppers, which I really like, giant mums, scarlet begonias, and snapping dragons. Snapping dragons are totally underappreciated, by the way. Uh, Carney has lily, roses, bird of paradise, ladies, slipper, and lavender. Fred's top five flowers were best flowers, the famous uh, actress that was a stand-in for everybody, the skunk in Bambi, Orlando Bloom, which that's kind of a stretch, I got it, Rose from Titanic, and Kim Flowers from uh, Fear and Loathing uh, in Las Vegas. So um, obviously uh, some miscommunication happens occasionally in the top five, uh, but pick your favorite list, pick a winner, there's no prizes other than bragging rights, and there you go. Those are top five flowers. And Chris got is the only only guest that's ever got to do a top five before. Here comes the train. Here's a chance to talk my, without Carney. My affinity for for Scarlet Pergonians goes back to my my deadhead days. I'm too young to actually be one, but I enjoy their studio music. I don't enjoy their live shows actually, um, because I'd rather hear seven songs than one 20 minute version of Paraffin Station. <laughs> scallops right, well, for me. I've been I've been making scallops since I was a kid because we uh, we did a lot of seafood up in Maine at one of the restaurants we had the snack shack. Scallops are one of those items that are easily overcooked and easily undercooked. It's challenging to hit it just right because uh, you kind of you you know when they're undercooked they're somewhat translucent. I um, mean you can physically see it, uh, but that time frame where it goes from translucent. Uh, to to really the texture you're looking for is about like 10 seconds. So you really have about 10 seconds to cook scallops right um, and not miss that range. Um, and they do continue to absorb some heat, so it's a really challenging spot to be in, but it's one of the most undercooked and one of the most overcooked uh, seafood items I've ever had. Yeah, I don't eat it, so I don't know the difference, but I know how to cook them. It's it's a huge difference. I mean, if you if you talk to my wife, who's who's a big seafood eater, and same thing with me, is that I mean, there's nothing worse than overcooked seafood. Um, and, and honestly, 
Overcooked scallops uh, or overcooked salmon or something like that is the equivalent you would have with made you a well done steak versus a medium rare. I mean, you you just you ruined it. You really ruined it at that point. Yeah, you lose you lose so much flavor when the texture's not right. I'm um, in that item. You know, it's not. You know, there's never really nothing. Yeah. You can throw sauce on it, but as soon as you get inside, it's just there. You know, it's just it's yeah. really noticeable. So I'm smoking. Shameless today, plug I'm, for my new. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm smoking the 2000 number threes. I was just with Lito this last week. He was uh, he was out for his first event. Um, so I'm smoking his cigar here. Really, really enjoying it. Great smoke. Um, I smoked a ton of football cigars over the weekend. But uh, oh, I'll bet. I'll it. bet. Yeah. The LFD football. So let's see. We got some got the risotto. Scallops so, are done. Scallops, scallops are done. I just put my last additional liquid in. Uh, once have you the plated? Liquid is almost. Yeah, have you ahead. plated those scallops or no? Or should we stay right on the grill cam? No, I'm, I'm, I'm staying on the grill cam. I'm waiting for. I'm going to plate the risotto with the scallops. Um, we probably got about three minutes before this liquid is fully absorbed. Uh, and then I'm going to add the cheese to it. At this point in time, we're at literally arborio rice, shallot, and chicken stock. Um, I haven't salted or peppered it yet because I'm using a strong fontina and a little parmesan. There should be enough salt in there anyways. And then with the roasted red pepper sauce on the plates, there'll be enough other flavor. Uh, so we might as well talk about the roasted red pepper sauce while I wait um, for the liquid to absorb. What I did is uh, instead of buying roasted red peppers, which you can do, and I'm sure they work fine, um, for people with gas grills, this would exclude people like Fred and uh, Jonathan Carney. <clears throat> you can throw them straight on your grill, turn on the flame, on open flame, and char the shit out of them, or go out on your outside grill, char them up. After you char them up, uh, Take them inside, throw them in a paper bag, close the paper bag. That will help steam them, and you'll be able to easily, after that, be able to easily off that skin that you never knew was on a bell pepper. Um, and then once you peel that off, throw it in a blender, throw it in with your ingredients. Super simple sauce. I think I had uh, garlic, mayonnaise, lemon juice, red pepper flakes, salt, and roasted red pepper. So super easy, make ahead of time. Uh, I ran mine through a sieve uh, or, or screen um, to get out the, the chunks to make a super smooth sauce. Um, you don't have to do mm -hmm. that. I only did that to about half of that. We're going to save the rest of that, that thicker stuff. And we're going to put it on uh, spaghetti squash tomorrow because the wife thinks that's spaghetti. It's not. <laughs> So cheese is Chris in. Goes up. That's pretty pretty standard. I don't always add all of it at first. I kind of like to see what kind of texture we're going with. Um, just a little bit of Parmesan because we need a little bit of salt in there. Uh, I always grade my cheese. I don't usually grade my own Parmesan because if you go to a good place, it's you know pretty freshly graded. Um, always shred your own cheese, though. I don't know if you know this, but they use a powder-type oil-based coating on pre-shredded cheese. Um, and if you yep. ever look at your pizza or your, you know, you're making lasagna or whatever you're making, that orange oil-looking thing that you just thought was grease is actually from the coating they put on pre-shredded cheese. So if you pre-shred, if you shred your own, you won't have that problem. Good tip, good tip. All right, I'm about ready to plate, so feel free to change the cameras if you want. Way ahead of you. What, uh, you wanna do the gourmet facts? Yeah, let's jump over and do some gourmet facts.
Can't hear you now. These are pretty creative this week. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Gourmet facts coming on. Here we go. These are brought to you by McGee Smoke Meeks and our friends at Crown Heads. Uh, they're having their sales meeting today, so that's why Brian's not with us. But uh, here we go. Gourmet facts. These are some good ones, Fred. So, uh, <clears throat> according to Eater.com, Italian restaurants are the most popular cuisine for Valentine's Day dates. Does not surprise me. Our next gourmet fact. According to legend, when St. Valentine was imprisoned, he wrote a letter and signed it from your Valentine. Reader's Digest reports the signature caught on, and now signing a love letter from a Valentine is common practice. Notice how I'm putting sources in here now? You know, we're getting bigger. We need to quote sources on these facts. Well, it's good because you've got guys in the chat room that'll bust you if you don't, you know, so there you go. And here's our next fact. We got five of these today. Candy hearts were originally medical lozenges. Not surprising because they taste awful. I like candy hearts. Oof. You don't like them? Nah, they're too pasty. Ah. They're, they're kind of like Tums to me. Like a little well, you can, only eat a you can only eat like a couple of them. You can't like throw a ton of them in your mouth. And you have to get the little ones, not the big ones. When have I ever, in your mind, thought that I ate a little of anything? <laughs> I'm, I'm just, uh, just throwing it out there. 65% of Americans believe Valentine's Day packaging should be in red and white. Uh, that's from the National Confectioners Association. So red and white are the colors of Valentine's Day to 65% of us. Okay. And our very last gourmet fact before we check on the scallops. Valentine's Day started with the Romans. This is according to History.com. There are two theories about the origin of Valentine's Day. And according to History.com, the day derives from Lupercalia, a raucous Roman festival on February 15th where men stripped naked and spanked young maidens in the hopes of increasing their fertility. Okay. Love all of it. And those are your well, gourmet well, facts well, well. brought to you by McGee Smoke Meats and our friends at Crown Heads. Crown Heads. Nice. Cigars. Good gourmet good gourmet facts. You've really stepped up your gourmet fact game. Thank you. And we'll take it back over to Chris here as he's plating. Tell us what you're going now. What's oh, going, what you got going on? Almost done. I put uh I put the roasted red pepper down first. Um, scallops on top of that. A little swipe to make it look like, you know, fancy. I am using a Microgreen garnish of onion, which I thought was super fun. I tasted it. It's like onion. Um, it smells like onion. Super cool. Right on top of the microgreen onion. Um, just a little caviar for color, um, salt, whatever. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure people eating here. I have one person behind the camera who's pregnant. I don't know if you know if they're allowed to eat caviar, um, but we'll find out. <laughs> Uh, just a little green for color, and I don't think I'm missing anything on the garnish here. So, there's course number one. Got to go that way for camera. Beautiful. Got the risotto, the scalp, the roasted red pepper, and the garnish. The texture of that red beautiful. pepper sauce looks, looks great. Looks really nice. I would think I would think that the uh, listeria risk on caviar of that size is pretty low. Um, speaking to the pregnant people that may be watching the show, um, I think you got it's like a like a smoked salmon gravlax or something is probably like more the more the worry. Yeah, I think we're gonna probably stick away from the tartar too on that, but. Um... What do I know? My wife's only an OBGYN. I should have researched this. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least you have a doctor on site so you can confirm if the food's edible for your guests. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And if it's not, she'll be the first one to be able to, you know, help us out in the process. Actually, this meal looks outstanding. I'm actually, I'm actually very, very impressed. Um, you know. Um, quick, quickly plate uh, two more for. The rest of the people struggling through watching me cook. Um, it won't be as pretty, but it will taste <laughs> good, right? So, I don't know. We got anything else to fill time before I dump the meat yeah, in? Yeah, we've there? got our uh, would, you, would You Rather. 
Um, so, uh, do we have a Would You Rather this week? Absolutely, we have a Would You Rather. All right, so sponsored so. by the Red Meat Lovers Club. So the way the rules are, I know you've seen it. There's going to be a Would You Rather. You only pick one or the other. We've only had one episode where everybody agreed, uh, which I believe was the Omar episode, was the only time everybody agreed on every single question. It never happens among the three of us, and certainly not four. But uh, let's see what we got here. Go ahead, Jonathan. So, would you rather wait an hour to be seated or go to a fast food restaurant? Oh, I'll wait an hour. In the bar. Depends on depends what depends what I'm waiting on. I, I hate waiting, waiting in lines. I hate waiting in any types of lines. I refuse to wait an hour for pretty much anything. Uh, so I'm going fast food. I would go fast food too, unless there's a Michelin star that I've been dying to eat at, and then I would understand. And I don't wait, think wait, you have wait. to wait so, an hour so, so, for that. Wait a minute. So, like, if you're talking about going to a really good steak place, you won't wait an hour for a good steak and go in the bar and have a drink or a glass of wine. You'd rather just go down to McDonald's instead? I'm I'm, I'm saying that I'm going to have to wait an hour. I can't get to the bar. I'm talking a full wait where, they're like, you have to wait an hour. There's no room at the bar. You know, where I have to sit yeah. there and do nothing for an hour, I'm not doing it. I'm going to fast food. And, I uh, mean, an, an, an hour is my max, but I have found that 20 to $40 all of a sudden turns out into about a 15-minute wait. Yeah, arguably. Could Just be. saying. Just saying. <laughs> so we already ruined that one. There's no uh, there's no waiting time there. So we, we you guys would both wait. I refuse to. I'm going fast food. All right. I, know, would I you thought Chris, rather... said, Chris said fast food, didn't he? He said, "Unless it was a Michelin star restaurant, so he he, he made it yeah. he made it conditionally conditionally." And I think, well, yeah, but he's, star he's fast food. It's it's not a Michelin star restaurant. All yeah, right, going to a Michelin star restaurant, you're gonna have a reservation. So, uh, would you rather get to write the script for the Valentine's Day episode of your favorite TV show, or get to be the Valentine's uh, be the guest on the Valentine's episode of your favorite TV show? So, Chris, you're you're the guest on your favorite show right now. So, um, you know, you've got to live this uh, one. I actually fancy myself quite the witty writer. I'm actually poor at public speaking and far better on on uh, pen and paper. So I would go writer. Fred, uh, I'd rather be I'd rather be on the show than write the show. Uh, so I fortunately get to be on and write the show. Um, so I, I would I would probably say I'd rather be on as well than write it. All right, here we go. Would you rather completely burn your dinner or order food from your least favorite restaurant? I mean, how least favorite are we talking here? Like, like still edible? No, I mean, I think it's your least favorite place on the planet. So, yeah, I, I would say probably your your work, the worst restaurant you can imagine going to. Would you rather completely burn your dinner or order food from? From the, oh, I would the most probably rather burn my dinner. Eat. I mean, either, either way, I'm not eating at the end of the day, so I'm guessing I'll just burn my dinner then. Because I mean, there's certain restaurants you will not eat at no matter what. So either way, I'm not eating. Burn, burn my dinner because I don't burn my dinner. So well, you I'm do gonna, in this case. Yeah, you got to in this case. So I'd rather burn right, my fine. dinner than order for a place I, I hate. Burn, Burn my dinner, but I know it won't be that bad because I was the, I'm the one that burned it. How about that? Yeah, it was a black and blue steak. Gotcha. And here's yeah. our final would you rather. Here we go. A you know what? We had a very good comment here. I'm just going to add this in here. Uh, Alexandra Ferrer says she would uh, burn her dinner because that gives you an excuse to order dinner from your actual favorite restaurant. Oh, uh, like look that. at you with the loophole. That's the yeah. loophole. Well I gotta find. Played. I gotta find this girl. She sounds good. Um, yeah, here we go. Loophole. Would you rather have bright red skin, or have your heart beat loud enough for everyone in the room to hear it? I mean, I'll heartbeat. take the bright red skin. You know, heartbeat. The heartbeat thing sounds like it wouldn't be good for your health. Neither does the, the red skin. So um, I'm going to assume my heart's going to beat loud enough for him to hear it without any side effects. So I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm still, I'm going to go with the bright red skin. 
I just think that if I'm sitting next to a guy that his heart's beating loud enough for everybody to hear it, it's going to be annoying. I can handle sitting next to a guy that's got bright red skin. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your Would You Rather brought to you by the Red Meat Lovers Club, uh, www.rmlclub.com. They started doing some in-person events. Again, some big stuff coming up for them. So visit the Red Meat Lovers Club uh, there. So now we're on to uh, Chris. And I know you have a special segment tonight here at the end, Fred. So uh, I do have that lined up for you. Um, but I also, in you the know meantime, what? It was it was only and only if needed. So I don't I don't think it was really needed. We we were prepared depending on how well you know Chris decided to play here. But he's been awesome guest and and actually cooked some really good things. So I, I think it just stays in the bag and we share with okay. privately what we had ready to go. Okay. Okay. Well, I do have some behind the scenes shots of uh, of Chris's setup here. This was him getting set up prior to the show. Uh, you saw some behind the scenes here where his cameras are set up. Um, his iPad here in his kitchen area. Uh, so he did take the time. We appreciate that. Um, so any guests that come on the show, uh, this is the uh, this is this is what's expected. So thank you, Rose, for setting the, that's uh, right the, the standard. The bar the bar has been raised so, not only for guests but our but our our, our hosts as well. <laughs> so I don't know if um, if they're still sponsors or not, but I used uh, Carney's buddies in. Uh, in Miami, and I ordered a Wagyu tri-tip because the show notes that I received um, were just copy and pasted from the show notes of the last episode where uh, Mr. Omar decided to cook langoustine instead of a rare cut of meat. Um, so I found the rarest cut of meat I was comfortable cooking. It's a tri-tip. Um, I got it from the guys in Miami. It is a Wagyu-grade tri-tip. Because it is frigid and cold and dark outside, I don't have time to slow cook it um, or even use the grill to char some of the fat. So I, I broke down and I trimmed the whole thing almost clean like a tenderloin. Uh, and then I sous vide it and it's going in a pan. Um, I don't actually, it won't fit in my cast iron. So it's going in my uh, hybrid cast iron carbon steel pan. Um, it should be fine. We're starting it with oil. Um, it is a funky shaped uh, cut, that triangle muscle. Um, so it's going in. I'm going to use a grill press so we can maximize uh, the surface temperature. I want to put a quick char on it. It was in a CV at 125. I normally would go like 128 before C searing, but... Um, because it's going to have to be in there for longer for a sear on this size of a cut, I, I went 125. Should probably end up 130-ish after rest. We're running out of time as I see it's 6 o'clock, so no, we're we'll doing well. resting for very long. No, we're good. So, Cole, so Chris, what uh, what oil did you use in there? I did a, um, I did a standard olive oil um, towards okay. the end after I uh, get a good – crust on one side and the crust is almost done on the next side i am going to add butter um don't want to add butter right away because it's got a far lower smoke temp and uh, even with this commercial style uh bent above me it was just burnt butter is just bad yeah there's a difference yeah. between brown butter and burnt butter I but think I want to bring to attention to uh, one comment here. Uh, Nicholas Stack says uh, from the Would You Rather, he would rather have red skin because if he was sitting next to Chris with those flowing locks, his heart would be beating inappropriately. Okay. Mr. Stack is a, grooms, a groomsman in, in my wedding, so he's going to have some smart-ass comments. So this grill press is great. I use it for a lot of things. Um, I, I love I love grill. grill presses. If you don't have a grill press at home, um, I've used this technique before when I didn't have a panini press uh, to make Cubano sandwiches. But just go out to your garage, find a brick, wrap it in foil. It works just as good. Good for hash browns also. Yeah, I don't know how to flip hash browns like you, but I'm working on it. <laughs> just make sure they're really compact. <laughs> I, I use this product for hash browns. I don't know if you've seen a Costco sell, but they're dehydrated. You put boiling water in like a, a milk carton, you wait 10 minutes. They're unbelievable. Don't have to worry about the, thawing I, or you freezing. You know what? 
we were talking about you know things that people get out of the way. So like Simply Potatoes makes a shredded uh, potato that's in kind of the it's kind of near the dairy section or whatever. But they're 100% potatoes, 100% shredded. I just grabbed those because and they, they you know they put them in the put them in the in the fridge. Those are pretty good just for 100% real potato. And I think they're probably very similar. I've had somebody that had the ones in the carton you're talking about and said they were fine too. Yeah, I love them. They're so easy. Cole says he sells a ton of dehydrated shredded hash browns. I love dehydrated shredded hash browns. So as I'm waiting for a little color, and I don't know how this is going to work, but this is the first time I've done a chai tip inside. But as I'm waiting for a little color, uh, we'll talk about a component of the uh, creme brulee that I did for dessert. Pretty standard creme brulee brulee recipe super easy for when you're entertaining because you ideally should make it the day before and let it sit in the fridge and let it set up um biggest trick in in baking a creme brulee is the water bath it'll distribute the heat you won't end up with you know chunky custard um it's a nice little easy trick uh nothing too fancy um but for the topping before we started I, I did a macerated, it looks like raspberry and blueberries that I ended up with. Macerating is super simple. Don't even need heat. A couple hours before you're ready to use it. Just, you know, sprinkle some regular plain old sugar on it, mix it up. And the longer it sits, the more juicy and, and, and you know, berry sauce-like it's going to get. It works great on ice cream, too. Yeah, I was gonna say I do that on ice cream a lot. Yeah, and when Chris flips there, I want to bring up real quick. Uh, we do have the Hacking Gourmet store online. It's uh, www.hackinggourmet.com. You can check out our swag store online. There we have aprons, we have shirts, t-shirts, hoodies, hats. I actually have a few of the hats waiting for me up in Maine. But you can visit hackinggourmet.com not just for the swag store, but for all episodes, information on the gourmet smoke sessions. We also are adding instructional videos on there um, and uh, in recipes, our top five lists, and uh, all of our episodes are there. Uh, so you can check that out. Go to hackinggourmet.com. Nice. There you go. In retrospect, for presentation purposes, I probably should have tied this particular beef muscle. It's going to be super flat. Um, if I tied it, it might have held the shape better, but oh well. I'll be honest, when it comes to tri-tip, you, you can tie that up, Chris, but um, the way you're, are you going to be putting this in the oven at all, or are you just doing it right on the right on the skillet? He's already sous vide it. No, it, oh, you sous -vide it's, it. it's been sous vide. It, it went oh. in the skillet at 125, so. Yeah, you're fine. I, I like tri-tip a little flatter, to be honest with you. It cuts up a little easier. Um, it cooks a little bit thoroughly. I, I like the way it just, cuts. I, yeah. yeah, I like the way it cuts when it's flatter, to be honest. Yeah, but since you sous vide it, it's going to be cooked, you know, even throughout regardless. All right, butter in. And the flat, the flatter is also easier to get the seal out, the, se the, the sear out of as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A few cloves of just smashed garlic, nothing fancy. Some rosemary. We'll baste it for a couple minutes. And if you guys have time or let me have time, I'd like to let it rest for at least five minutes. Yeah, let's do it. I absolutely want to see the finished product. I feel I feel like I've failed in some some small uh, way. Uh, baby, can you get the cutting board that's in the basement on the bar? Um, I don't have a wood butcher cutting board because nobody ever sent me my custom deep juice weld cutting board. Fred, don't don't uh, abandon that special segment yet. I'm just getting warmed up. Um, <laughs> but. I forget where I was with that. Anyway. I think we should. I think we should run the special segment, Fred. Oh man, I don't know. I I, I think it was. He's played very nice with everybody. You know, I'm I'm, I'm 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 impressed. He is very. He does play nice in the sandbox when it's not a comment section on Facebook. <laughs> well, I know I would. And by the way, I'd be. I'd want my you know deep well uh, cutting board too. I've got a nice cutting board from Wood Butcher, but it's way too small. I don't know if you've seen the size of steaks and prime ribs I cook, but I would have way more photos if I had a bigger board. 
You can't. You can't hit me too bad. I bought your book and, and on tape just to watch it, just so I can listen to you tell it. Yeah, yeah. Man, maybe we skip the special segment, Fred. Nah. <laughs> That looks, there good. Are times that looks find, really good. There, there are times I find myself memeing or something and go, God, that's an incredible book. I shouldn't be doing this. He hates this. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can shave. We can save that segment. It'll always be here in the program, Fred. So if we ever need it, we have it. That's right. That's right. That looks really good. That looks really good. And, and Chris, not only is Meat and Bone a sponsor, they're a great partner of ours, um, and. The grill cam you've been doing is sponsored by them, so we've had Meat and Bone on there. If you're interested on there, you can jump in and go to meatandbone.com and search for Tri-Tip, and they have several different options. They have a Wagyu with a BMS grade of 8, 9 on it. They have some A5 uh, picanha on there as well, and they have A5 uh, Tri-Tip, I believe, as well. they got some really unique cuts and options with uh, with Tri-Tip, um, so you can jump on there, Meat and Bone, great prices on it. So, uh, yeah, meatandbone.com. Yeah. I ended up going with the three to five Wagyu um, because I, I don't need three to five, but I knew I was going to trim it to, trim it down, so I probably ended up closer to three. I ordered it, uh, ordered it on a Friday. They, their website says something about they ship on Mondays or Tuesdays. It went out on Monday. I had it on Thursday in special ice packs. It was still frozen. Um, perfect. Yeah. No coupon code, though. I wish I was looking for a coupon code. Yeah, the, you, uh, if you're a first-time buyer, uh, you can go to meatandbone.com, and uh, you can plug in meat first. Spell it out. It's M-E-A-T-F-I-R-S-T, and they will give you 10% off. Uh, now that we are starting to travel around a little bit in person again, uh, we are working on a Hacking Gourmet uh, discount code with them as well, so that should be coming yep. out soon. And those of you that have used use meat first as your coupon code, meat second does not do anything. I can tell you that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, Fred, when you order for meat and bone, you have to communicate with them more than anyone I've ever talked to. Um, well, I'm a, li- I'm a little nervous because the, the, the call came in from them on my order uh, literally five minutes ago. And I, so I, I, and I was on the show, and I didn't want to catch them before they left. So I, I forwarded that email back to Tracy and said, hey, can you um, – can you give him a call while I'm on the show or whatever? And uh, the only thing I got back from Tracy was called, and I will fill you in when the show's over. And I'm like, oh, that can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just because Brian's not here doesn't mean we don't have any actual lettuce on the show. Um, I did a, what did I do? I did an arugula and a radicchio quick chop. Um, technically, I did a little chiffonade. That just means little ribbons. I'm now dressing it lightly with a local uh, store-bought restaurant, uh, I'm sorry, dressing called Garlic Expressions. We've loved it forever. We didn't know it was actually Toledo Loco, local until uh, recently. This is going to go be a bed for, for the beef once I cut it. So if you if you if you missed that, Jonathan and Brian McGee, if you're uh, paying attention to the show, what 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 uh, Chris just said was he's making a radicchio arugula tartar. So I just wanted to make sure I put it in your language that you understood what that was. It's a true story. That's what we're doing. Tartar. Oh. Tell us about golf in, in Florida, Fred. While while we need to stretch time here. You know days. what? It's it's uh, it's been nice, but we've been un. I mean, okay. So I'm not one. Well, I'm from Wisconsin, so don't, don't think that I don't know that this is nothing compared to real winters and all the other stuff. But it ha- I've had several rounds in the last two to three weeks that I have teed off at 39, 40 degree weather, which is cold which is very cold for here. Um, I, I don't care where you are. I mean, you can only swing so well in 40 degree weather. I don't care if you've got all the Under Armour on, which I do. Um, once you get to 50, you're golden and it's fine at 50 as long as it's not super windy. But yeah, it's been unseasonably cold here. It's been really, it's been really weird but and windy and windy. But um, you know what? I, I, I get to golf, so I, I, I can't complain. Um, I, 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 you know, our bad days. 
and I could go out later. I like to go out in the morning. I don't like to kind of kill my whole day, but um, I, I love the game. You know, it's a, it's a love hate relationship. I'm as good as I'm ever going to be. I'm, I'm about an eight handicap. I'll probably never get any better and very slowly get worse as I get older and older. The fact that I can still swing a club uh, amazes me. So I'll just stick with that. You know? Yeah. Well, at least you're out there. I've been hitting the golf simulator around here and it's almost the same, um, but it's not the same. They're yeah. Pretty accurate I just don't like, days. I don't like mats. I don't like mats. I just, I, you know, they correct it a little bit and just psychologically, but uh, you know what? In a pinch, like when we were up in Washington State and I couldn't golf in the winter, um, you know, you can make little games out of the simulators and stuff like that, and it's it's way better than nothing. Uh, top golf is a huge, huge thing. Um, I, you know, I think once they spread more north and stuff and put some heated bays out there, top golf could be just an absolute game changer on there. Even non golfers like top golf. Yeah. Well, speaking of your Washington trip, uh, on, on a simulator the other day, we played the. Uh, we played that course with the, the floating, moving green. Uh, Coeur d'Alene Resort, yeah. Um, I happened to stick it like, I don't know, five feet from the pin. Probably the best three iron simulator shot, or three, par three simulator shot I've ever hit. It's funny because, so those of you who aren't familiar, so it's an actual island and the lake, and they can move it around at night, and you take a little boat over there, to get there, um, you know, they can, you know, your caddy may try and bet you on whether she can park the boat without looking, but it's on a cable system. Most people don't know that, but it's on a cable system. But anyway, it can play anywhere from 150 yards to 220 yards, depending on where you are. Uh, and it's a, and it's a giant green. I'm not going to lie. It is a giant green. And they're really, in most cases on a par three, you shouldn't miss it. But when you're staring at an entire lake, it becomes a completely different shot. Um, but it's beautiful. The whole course is beautiful. All right, well, in the interest of time, I'm going to slice and play. Um, ideally, I would have gone a few minutes longer, but whatever. It's still going to taste fine. I don't know if you want to go back to plating camera. John, I don't know if he's awake still. Guy who woke up at 4 o'clock this afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm dialed in here. The production's been very good. We've all sorts of different camera angles. Picture in picture is fantastic. Yeah, oh, no, it's actually really nice. I'm hoping that's medium rare. By the touch test, I don't know. We'll see. One quick note on knives. We don't all have it like John Carney, so we can't all send our knives in when they get dull. Um, buy yourself a good knife. Use a buy yourself a good knife. Steel, 45 degrees, like you're cutting paper. Do that every time you use it. You'll never have to send your knife in. By the way, I, Chris, you bring up a good point, and I haven't done enough sous vide to to answer this question accurately. I have found that the sous vide is a lot tougher to do the typical touch test the way when you're normally grilling because it changes the composition of the meat enough that our traditional touch test of when you got something on the grill does not apply. Um, or is not as accurate, I should say. Thoughts? You're probably you're probably right about that. Um, this is actually pinker than I thought it would be based on my my touch test. So um, you're probably right about that. I don't. I, it gives you. It still gives you a good general rule of thumb with with the touch. Yeah. But um, well, we're used we're used yeah, to a resistance. Right we're used to a resistance off a grill. And that resistance is not yeah. uniform. The resistance coming off of the uh, sous vide is going to be more uniform and more stretching the outside uh, layer. So yeah, you know, I, guess, I guess you could get used to it no matter what. But I guess it, that's the nice thing about the sous vide. I guess it doesn't matter. You basically just, you know, okay, here's the temperature. Right. I still have a love-hate relationship with the sous vide and it still leans towards mostly, mostly hate. Uh, only because I think if you really know how to cook steaks and, you, and you're not doing it for a, a number of people, which I understand, Jonathan, that's, that's a different consideration. But if you're just talking straight up, I'm cooking a couple steaks, um, man, there's some just residual flavor and stuff that you get just throwing it on a grill that I don't care if you reverse sear it or sous vide it and sear it and however you want to play it. Uh, I just don't think the flavor is quite the same for me. Yep. You can't no, get that crust. You cannot sear that crust as good as doing it right out of the gate on a good no, and then and then the um, you know that's where that tempered cooking method comes in because you keep adding to that crust um, every time you you go for a cook on it. 
but you know sous vide for me has been you know i use it when i'm using you know this next gourmet smoke session i'll be cooking our our twin fillets i'll be cooking those on a grill and i'll be yeah. doing lobster tails on a grill but i've got 100 pounds of uh, essentially of yeah you have filet to you have to yeah it's just it's no way to, to do it um unless you're just going to sit there and slave over it and you know on our presentation that we did friday night at uh, at davidoff with corona cigars um while i was doing the show the food was cooking and when i was done we you know, my my team that i have with me cut the bags open put the sauce on and it was done yeah i mean i don't, I don't well, think most people realize so i mean sous vide sous vide is bit oh that looks gorgeous yeah underrated on the uh on the bowl by the way underrated uh presentation on the bowl bowls make for great presentations. oh yeah, yeah 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 and that, that's fantastic looking beautiful I love that. That looks good. Outstanding. Um, one thing on Savid, right, so Savid's have been around um, since 1970. So this is, you know, I mean, when everybody's talking about Savid new, it's not a new method at all. It's been around since 1970 uh, and was perfected for hotels and everything else. So it's not a new process, but we're all still playing with it. That's it. See, Chris. Nope. Out. Nope. Four courses, sir. Four courses. We can do this in 90 seconds. Good. Something else I away. something else I don't get to eat. Are you gonna torch it? Yeah, I'm gonna torch it. Oh, yeah, he's torching it. Here comes the sugar. Here comes the torch. We've got the love music playing. Our brand new Valentine's Day music. It's called the rose Swish. in the background. Swish it around. It's sugar. It's not expensive. Don't buff the extra. <laughs> thank, thank God I own a cigar store and uh, I had a torch laying around. So my old torch died. This one's not going to be great either. Brand new can. Doesn't work. Anyways, um, you know how it looks at the end. Oh, no. To play, to play me off. <laughs> <laughs> it was going so well. Oh. Anyway, so what he's doing is he's just torching the top of it, which is just melting the sugar. You just keep it moving very fast, very light, touches and feather it, and it eventually gets a nice little brown crust. Uh, on there. Trick is to just always keep it moving uh, as long as the torch is working. Always back up torches in my house. Absolutely. Is that a jet line? It is a jet line. Um, it's not quite powerful yeah. enough for creme brulee, but it is a workhorse, man. I leave this thing out by the hot tub. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't snow. know they were making a creme brulee. They didn't know they were making a creme brulee torch. I thought that was a joke. <laughs> yeah, hey, well, it works thing. in a pinch. Yeah. That's the idiot. That's Bruce Vector's Warren, beast. Right? That's the, yeah, that's the beast. Well, you're still getting some good color on there, so it's doing its job. This is, yeah. There. It just takes forever. I need a sous chef to work on this while I work on my torch. Anyways, you get the point. Um, your macerated berries end up looking like this when you're all said and done. Perfect. And that's dessert, boys. I couldn't find fresh mint anywhere for a green garnish. Um, but what do you do? It's the middle of Michigan. That looks good. Well, Chris, man, thanks for coming on the show. I know you uh, you give us a lot of uh, uh, conversations in the chat, but we do appreciate you. And um, you, you you did an amazing job, as we knew you would, because we see your post as well. So thanks for coming on. Jonathan, anything else to say? Or you sign off. It's all you now. Gourmet, uh, gourmet Smoke Session coming up on J February 19th. Stay tuned for that. You can visit our webpage for details and how to participate in the Smoke Session. It's under Gourmet Smoke Sessions at HackingGourmet.com. Also visit our partner pages uh, at meatandbone.com for the Gourmet Smoke Session packages. And you can check out all of our sponsors online there. And if you're in Ann Arbor, Michigan, go up to Tobacco Rose. Check it out. Great little shop with a lot of spirit to it. Chris, you're a good friend. We Absolutely. appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, we will see you on February 19th. Thanks, everybody.